Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. This time on Broad and High, we'll meet a German village woodturner. Everybody tells me I can't do this. We'll bring you the chalk drawings of an anonymous duo known as Danger Dust. And join us for a special tea time. Every culture has some kind of a neat tea tasting, tea enjoying tradition. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan, your host for Broad and High, the ultimate intersection of arts and culture, where we explore the character and creativity not only in Columbus, but across the country. When Dennis Devendra decided to take up wood turning and using lathes, he struggled to find mentors who would teach him. People were apprehensive about helping a blind man operate machinery that reaches speeds of up to more than 1,000 RPMs. But Dennis persevered despite his challenges and is now the vice president of the Central Ohio Wood Turners Association. We visited Dennis at his German Village workshop where he makes all of his creations. So I have been turning wood since 2004. Wood turning is the process of shaping wood. Now all the tools, everything stays still and the wood spins and the, then you carve the wood with, with the tools. And the wood that you want to use for wood turning, I mean, pretty much anything, I mean, you, you don't even have to use wood. You could use acrylics, people use styrofoam. There's all kinds of, of materials you could use. What makes, gives you the best result is, is hardwoods. The, the harder the wood, the denser the grain, the smoother the finish, it, it can look pretty, pretty impressive once you get some of these hardwoods that, that come out with their colors. I haven't been blind forever. I didn't even know that I was going to go blind until I was in my about 20 years old. I have a hereditary eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa. I went blind um, when I was 27. Well, I stopped driving when I was 27 years old. I was doing some woodworking here in Columbus and I was over at the woodwork store. I, I went and I, I bought a, a lathe and some tools and, and took it home. and. It went okay for a while. I was making pens and getting a lot of success out of that. You know, I kind of got bored after a while and I really wanted to go a little further with, with my turning. Nobody wanted to, to work with me because they were afraid that, you know, working for the, with a guy who's blind, you know, that, oh, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be <laughs> working with power tools. See, this is emotional for me because it's so, um, it's, it's, everybody tells me I can't do this. A friend of ours in New York uh, was, was getting into wood turning as well, so he uh, he decided, you know, he was he was willing to show me how to turn a bowl. And I said, oh, that's great. So <clears throat> we went up to upstate New York, and we uh, we put a piece of wood on the lathe, and, and we spent the afternoon uh, turning a bowl. It was beautiful. I mean, it, <laughs> I look at it now; it's pretty bad. <laughs> but it was it was my bowl. It was a great bowl, and it was a good start. So I, I knew the mechanics at that point. So I brought the I brought you know took my knowledge and got some additional equipment and, and started turning bowls and started getting a little bit better at bowls. If you walked into my shop, you wouldn't say, hey, this is a shop for somebody who's blind. It's organized. When I have my shop laid out, I have the tools in a certain spot and I may even have marks on the handles. And so I know where all the tools are. For measuring, I have what's called a click stick, and it's it's just a, a, a device. It's about six inches long, and you and it clicks out at sixteenth of an inch increments. For centering, you know, when you put a piece of wood on the lathe, you need to have it centered so it doesn't it's not off center, so it doesn't rock when it goes on the lathe. You know, take a circle, just a piece of circle of wood, and exactly in the in the middle, you put a little hole. And so when you want to center a piece of wood with a nail, you just poke a little bit of a dimple in the wood. And so that's where you know to, to chuck up your lathe and how to, how to square it. 
Now there are there are safety concerns, but they're the same safety concerns as, as anybody. I use my my touch. I use my hearing when I turn uh, when I'm when I'm teaching other people, and I do do that now. Um, I listen, and I have them listen. When I rough down a piece of wood, it's going to be square when it's on the lathe, and so there's corners coming at me, and I just have to make sure my hands, I know where my hands are, and so once that wood is, is rough down to a, a cylinder, then I can put my hands on it and uh, feel the cuts as I'm making them. I do all this stuff by myself in the shop. Uh, the, the only thing that I, I ask somebody else to do, my wife to do, is, is she'll put the finish on for some of the things. And she'll uh, look through and see if there's a tool mark or something like that on the on the wood so that I can't feel that uh, besides that it's all it's all me it's not a matter of, of whether we're going to have challenges in our life it's like how do you deal with those are you going to are you going to let those challenges take you or are you going to take them on and, and overcome those challenges stop thinking about me as a blind person but thinking of me as a wood turner who's blind Learn more about Dennis and his creations online at blindwoodturner.com. The anonymous duo known as Danger Dust loves chalk. These two recent graduates of the Columbus College of Art and Design took it upon themselves this past school year to create a weekly chalkboard design with an inspiring quote, skillful typography, and stealth delivery. Each week, under the cover of darkness, they would erase the previous message and start all over on a clean board with an illustration that can take up to 10 hours to create. Their designs have generated a healthy following on social media, where everyone is asking, just who is Danger Dust? We both just love the idea of taking something that's like ordinary and then turning it into something that's like special. Yeah. Chalk is just so, it's in every classroom. You've been exposed to it since you were a little kid and asking something to do something that it's not intended to do. When we first started it, just no one knew who was doing it just because like it was so new and um, it was kind of like we were graffiti artists in some way, like, oh, who did that chalkboard? And, it felt very like mischievous, and so we wanted to come up with a name that was like sort of played on that. Like, yeah, it's, it's graffiti, I guess, but it's like <laughs> not at all at the same time. Yeah. We are both advertising graphic design. We have minors in copyright. I mean, neither of us had ever done chalk before, and it just seemed like a fun, easy thing to do. And when we first started, we didn't think it was going to be this big. Yeah, we'll come in, like we'll, we'll do the planning beforehand. It takes, it takes at least a day to plan, just yeah. to like figure out like what quote you're searching for. We have a catalog of quotes, and this one's been one that we've been wanting to do for a while. I don't know, we just thought of like, we brainstormed like kitchen utensils that would be fun to draw, and yeah. obviously gotta have some butter in there. We added the book and the cloth, like the towel on the bottom and the top at the last minute. Because we wanted to fill those spaces just because they felt mm -hmm. a little empty. I didn't want to put eggs on there just because I thought they'd be a boring shape. We both love to draw, but neither one of us are really great at drawing like... Without a reference. <laughs> yeah, if, if someone asked us to draw like a person or a dog mm -hmm. or something, we would both need to look at a reference. But with letters, you can just you can just draw them and they can be as abstract or as not as you want. And that's fun. That's, that's what I love about. Just pure chalking time is usually five or six hours. One of the boards took like nine hours and then we're coughing up chalk dust. We close the doors so that while we're working no one can like come in and see. Um, this is the only classroom that has locks on both of the doors. <laughs> so that's why we've staked this one out. This week was the first time that we tried sharpening the chalk. Yeah, sharpening the chalk and then paint brushes. That was yeah. fun. 
Well, flower just felt like a very like light, airy, kind of fluffy thing, and blending it felt more natural with the brushes. You know, you get a different um, effect from it, like when you're using your hands to blend it, when you're using a cloth to blend it, when you're using a Q-tip, and we realize now with the brush. We use Q-tips, we've used a lot of Q-tips, um, but they're nice for, uh, for like, especially like if you get them white, you can like clean a sharp edge with them. The fact that it's only a week helps you just like let it go. Really, that's my favorite part of it, the fact that it's like gone. Yeah. It's kind of liberating because like the, the work you do like for your school projects, it's, it's so long and drawn out and extended, but with this it's like something new every week. It's chalk. Yeah, it's never, it's never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Breaking away from your comfort zone is a good thing. Some of the first quotes we did um, were quotes that like one of our teachers told us in class that they really influenced me and I, I guess part of it was just wanting to share that. It's fun working with your hands and getting your hands dirty and like feeling exhausted at the, like when you're done with it, putting your whole body into something. I can, I can be doing four things at once while I'm working on the computer, but with chalk, you have to just be doing like chalk. Because you have Q-tips and brushes and chalk and be, rags in your and hands. You have to like go up in the corner and stand on the chair yeah. and go down to the other corner to fix that smudge, you know. We're um, an anonymous duo of chalk artists, and every week we create a new chalkboard, and after that week is over, we come back and erase it and do another one. Follow Danger Dust on Instagram where you can see all of their latest illustrations. Helping Hand Center for Special Needs is a nonprofit organization in Clintonville that serves the educational and therapeutic needs of children with autism and other developmental disabilities. And the instructors there believe strongly that the arts can be a valuable teaching tool. Many autistic children have food aversions and sensitivities, making mealtime a challenge for parents. Artist Eric Marlowe, who served this spring as an artist-in-residence at Helping Hands, worked with speech and occupational therapists to create an arts-based curriculum focused on food and nutrition. Helping Hands Center is a school and therapy center for children diagnosed with autism and other developmental disabilities. The prevalence of autism is now 1 in 68 individuals. Um, that's up 30% from their previous number, and that's a lot of um, adults and kids. It's a staggering number. It's really unfortunate and upsetting, and I know it's near and dear to all of our hearts here at Helping Hands. And we have a wide variety of ages, ranging from three to middle school age. Um, they have access to all types of therapies, including speech, music, physical, and occupational therapy. We have around um, 105 students, um, about 95 um, are identified students and the others are typical peer models. They come for school every single day. What we've learned is that children with autism and other developmental disabilities, they learn just like all children in so many different ways. And the one thing that we've learned is that the arts have played such an integral part of that. For instance, we have music therapy here where some of our kids who are nonverbal, for the first time they ever spoke was during music, was during songs, filling in the blanks. Um, and that's just a whole different approach. And so we really wanted to get some other means from the arts community into helping hands to help to see whether the further growth and expression there could be. Because some of our kids don't talk. Some of them are nonverbal. Some of them use augmentative communication devices. So how could they communicate through arts? Yes. So VSA Ohio has traditionally served um, all disabilities across the lifespan, um, but the autism community and the need for individuals with autism uh, is, is unique. And this is one of our biggest programs, Adaptation and Integration in the Arts. It is a, both a residency and a professional development program. So this was the second year that Helping Hand Center applied to be part of the Adaptation and Integration in the Arts program. And this year they proposed um, a, a residency that would look at different um, aspects of food issues that some of the students here at Helping Hands have. 
Some of our children with autism have aversions to different textures and different colors of food. So therefore they become very picky eaters and they're stuck with crunchy, carb-like foods, um, very plain white is very common. And we decided it would be great to have children play with their food without having an expectation of eating it. So combining art and food. Eric's been great because he's really brought that concept to life. Give me five. Okay. Well, I was asked to do a series of projects based on, on food and nutrition. And so I tried to come up with materials that would work from kids that are preschool through teenagers. Well, today was fruits and vegetables. And we tried to make a shape out of aluminum foil and then wrapped it with uh, a colored tissue paper and some twist ties. And uh, we had apples and oranges and bananas and carrots. And... Is this a fruit or a vegetable? It's a vegetable, that's right. Here's the real banana, and here's some banana art. We don't eat the art, but at the end there's this food that they can try that relates to the you know, the art project that we did. It's such a good job. You're doing a wonderful job, keep it up. Yes, very good. And then they'll have the opportunity at the end to actually um, sample some of the food. Just to watch, to see some of the growth that the kids in the classroom have made. Um, for instance, we have kids who just weren't wanting to touch certain foods, weren't, weren't even trying to eat certain foods. Um, and so our food acceptance team really felt that this would be a great opportunity to make food fun. What we've gotten back from parents and teachers and staff is that some of our kids are actually touching foods that they would never touch, that they were afraid of, maybe due to texture or smells. Um, they're touching the food, real food, um, and they're also trying some new food. Broccoli and bananas are two of our big success story. Uh, one of the children, the teacher was like, there's no way he's gonna wanna have broccoli on his plate, and he picked it up and ate it and asked for more. We are having kind of an open house art gallery for the parents to come and see all of the craft projects of food that the kids have made. And it's all about food, so they're going to show their mom and dads all the food that they've made, and then we're going to have snacks, you know, just like a regular art of you know. You know, with Eric, he hadn't necessarily worked with children with aut primary autism as their diagnosis before, and the growth and him learning about our students and him seeing how what he's doing is making a huge change has been, um, I think, incredible. I was surprised every day when I came into work with them. You know, things that I hadn't expected happened, and that, and I, it, I feel like it really has made a difference in my life, just being able to make a difference in theirs. Helping Hands Center for Special Needs aims to be the preferred organization for educational services related to autism. Visit them online at helpinghandcenter.com. Tea has been around for thousands of years, but didn't take off in the U.S. until the 1920s, when it was promoted by the women of the temperance movement and the American development of the tea bag led to its widespread popularity. In this segment, we visit Patali Teas, a Central Ohio company specializing in boutique-style teas, with shops in Alexandria and Granville. Founder Joy Wujek plays the role of tea concierge and walks us through several different types of teas, how they are selected and processed, and shows us why people still love tea so much. Well, I started with tea when I was a little girl. My first tea I made, I was nine years old. It was a strawberry leaf tea. Uh, what I like about tea is it's, it's a cultural anthropology lesson because every culture has some kind of a neat tea tasting, tea enjoying tradition. Look at that beautiful emerald foam. So we use a lot of flower petals in our tea blends. And I thought I needed to have a name that reflected the petals and Patali is petal in Italian. Our style of tea is a craft style or an artisan style. It's very chunky. It's not a tea bag cut. 
So there's a lot of botanicals in there and you need to get all of it in there to get the flavor. So when you say you need a tablespoon or 10 grams of tea, you really need that to, it, to maximize the flavor of the tea. So this is one of our most popular blends. This is one of the first ones I started with. This is a cranberry, just a simple cranberry tea. And it has beautiful, plump cranberries in it. And we use full cranberries. And it has apples from Canada. Hibiscus, which imparts the nice ruby red color. And it has uh, rose hips in it and a little bit of orange. I make all the teas. We have over 300 recipes. So our craft teas start off with interesting and fun ingredients. And a lot of times it's the ingredient that is the inspiration for the recipe. So here's an example of the tea that we made with the butternut squash. And it has a little bit of peach in it, chamomile, um, spices from, uh, that you would have in a pumpkin pie. So when it's all completed and you drink it, it tastes just like a, like a little pumpkin pie with a little bit of the, um, the chamomile flavoring. We love to blend with uh, lemongrass. This is an organic style lemongrass and uh, it adds a really nice citrus quality to tea. For fun, we like to add candy to some of our teas. When we send you out the door with your tea, we're gonna give you a label and it's gonna tell you how much tea to put in for an, into a steeper for an eight ounce cup. We're also gonna tell you the time and we're gonna tell you the temperature because different teas require different temperatures and different times for steeping. All, all of our teas have caffeine in them. If you want a caffeine free product, it had no caffeine to begin with, it would be an herbal tea. I have a tendency to blend teas that have the first note you taste is the tea and then there is the hint of the flavor and that's my preferred way of blending because I think everyone should enjoy the flavor of the actual tea leaf. Everybody has something that they really like. There's nothing more personal than your palate. So we try to really find out what do you like and then people don't stray from that. They like to stay right within their palate. Some customers they don't want anything in their tea other than the pure tea leaf. So we have two shops. We have the one in Granville next to the Huntington Bank and that's a boutique style. And then we have the shop here. The shop here at, in Alexandria has 1,100 square feet of tea and tea accessories. The shop in Granville has 300 square feet and it's more gift oriented and we have about 80 teas there. There's 300 teas at the shop in Alexandria. So when I first started selling tea 11 years ago or longer, um, people thought I was selling potpourri. They didn't understand what a loose leaf tea was. So, so it's, just, it's just exciting to be able to talk to people now. They, they're really excited about it. So the specialty tea market is really growing. Tea can be an uh, interesting experience. It always puts me in a poetic mood or a zen mood, just a relaxing experience. Just the art of making tea, it gives you a mindfulness, slows you down. Mm -hmm. Tart and delicious. Um, the health benefits are incredible and it, it's just a really nice feeling to drink a cup of tea. Patala Teas has storefronts in Granville and Alexandria. Check them out online at herbs-teas.com. The Dublin Arts Council is home not only to fine art displays, but also fine feline displays. Allow us to introduce you to its four-legged employee, Dart, the Gallery Kitty. We don't say welcome to Dublin Arts Council, we say are you allergic to cats? In the building itself we have a gallery series, um, we have classes and camps over the summer and then outside the building we have a concert series and we have a, a plethora of public art. Yes, we have a full-time resident who is the most popular staff member in the building, uh, his name is Dart. Dart is a stray that sort of came to us through one of our staff members. The story is he was living on a farm and um, not getting along with the rest of the cats. So we received a call from Pennsylvania and they said, you know, would you consider the cat? So of course the staff came to me and said, you know, there's this cat and could we possibly, you know, take the cat as a, you know, gallery cat? 
So I agreed and uh, you know, the cat just sort of won us over. Well, he attends all meetings, if he can. Uh, and it's always meetings where you have lots of papers on the desk or on the table. Uh, hands down, he'll be there and he'll lie right on the papers. He just sort of dispels the, um, the elite sort of sense of uh, the gallery and the Arts Council. He just sort of brings it down to a level where, okay, I'm comfortable here, this was an old home, you know, it just happens to be a gallery where there's art. It's something to talk about other than, oh, there's a grant due or we're not going to meet budget this month. Um, it just sort of brings it all down to some sort of a calm um, take on the world. That's our show. To see more of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you at the ultimate intersection of arts and culture next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com.